Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. The last few weeks of the summer, I have been preaching on the seven churches, and all of that uh, work-oriented messages kind of got me in the mood for a good sermon on grace. <laughs> it's got to be a balance, you know. The grace of God that comes to man with no strings attached. And then because of the grace of God, the things that God asks us to do for others, for him. I have um, preached, I think, on the most beautiful passages in the New Testament on grace. And I wanted to come from a little different angle today, so I uh, chose an Old Testament text which has been very, very interesting to me as I have read the Bible through the years. And I think the reason this is so interesting to me is the situation that Israel was in when God made this statement. And it's found in the paragraph that follows what Vernon read. I'm going to be um, dealing with Ezekiel 36, 22 through 32, a very famous passage. And I want to set the stage here, if I can, so you can see the historical background. Ezekiel is a prophet of the exile. He was taken into captivity under one of the three deportations of Nebuchadnezzar around the year 597 B.C. He was resettled with most of the artisans and the rich and the political and the priest by an um, irrigation canal close to the city of Babylon called Kibar. Jeremiah lived in the same time Ezekiel did, but Jeremiah is back in Jerusalem. They did not take him into captivity. And he is dealing with the Jews who remained in the land, the small group there. Ezekiel is the prophet of the large group of Jewish people that had been taken into Babylon. I think it's very hard for us to understand the emotional trauma that's connected with something like this. The psalm, one of the psalms that speak most to me of how the Jews felt about this is the psalm that says we hung our harps on the willow trees for how can we sing the songs of Zion in a foreign land their homes were gone completely gone I, 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 don't, I can't get a cultural metaphor to describe what happened to these people unless it would be something like what if one day every church of every denomination across the United States was leveled to the ground and every religious leader was taken in chains to a foreign nation and every Bible and religious book you had was burned and you were not allowed to meet anymore for your faith? That might slightly make an illusion. Now, if with that you would picture that half of your relatives have been killed by the sword and half of your little children have starved to death in this, and that the people who came and took you were very cruel, mean, ugly, God-hating people, and you wondered, God, how could this happen? You promised, and look what's happened. Then maybe you could catch a glimmer of the disaster that hit the nation of Israel. You know, they... We're studying the book of Jeremiah on Wednesday night, verse by verse, which happens to fit the same context. And remember, as Jeremiah wonders, why won't the people listen to my message if they just repent? Well, the people were trusting in the divinic and Isaiah promises of God that said, I've put my name here, I'll deliver you, nothing will happen. And they forgot that God loved them enough to change the situation that was causing them to trust only in externals, only in the cultic system of Israel and not in a personal relationship. And so I, I don't know how to convey to you the horror 
of a total devastation of the land that God chose his name to dwell in. I don't know how I can communicate to you the fact that the Ark of the Covenant, the symbol of the presence of God, was, the, was taken and never found again after this period right here. The temple that was the physical symbol of, the, of God's presence and covenant with his people was raised to the ground. He said a plowman could draw a plow right over the area where the temple was. Folks, what a disaster hit the people of God. And as they were in, in, in captivity and, the, and Jerusalem was destroyed, man, they begin to wonder, God, what about these promises you've made? You said there'd always be a man on the divinic throne. What has happened? Don't, do you love us anymore? Is there any hope? God, what can we do in the midst of this kind of setting? The words of Ezekiel are very, very important for us to understand. Two very difficult things for us to understand. And that is the grace of God, no strings attached, free. Romans 6.23, you know, it is a gift of God, a free gift of God, not of works any man should boast. Now, over against that are the requirements that God places on his people. We may even make it a different dichotomy. The unconditional promises of grace that God has made versus the covenant requirements of man that he has placed on them, the conditional promises. Now, we have real tension between those two. In the place where I am able to draw some kind of, of understanding between the two is a text like this. Now, before I read it, I would like for you just to look at it quickly. I'd like for you to get your pencil out. And I'd like for you to circle the number of times in this few passages from 22 to 32 where God says, I will, 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 11 times. Eleven times God says, I will. If, I, if, I, if my theology is going to be anything, I want to be in God will, not Bob will. If I've got to start anywhere, I'll start with John Calvin. You know, I don't think he has the whole picture, but he's certainly got the place to start, and that is the sovereignty of God. Friends, if God doesn't do it, it's not going to be done. The place to begin everything is I will, says the Lord. Now, that tells me that we're not in a passage that's dealing with the responsibilities of man. We're in a passage that's dealing with the promises, the initiative, the action, the trustworthiness, the validity of God. So let me begin in verse 22, and you circle those every time it says, I will. I've entitled this, I thought of a, several titles, and none of them fit the context. <laughs> they were so good. Well, I'll save them till later. Uh, God's yes amidst man's no. God's yes amidst man's no. Now think what I'm trying to say with that. Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you went. And remember this text that Vernon read was talking about how God was so upset that Israel, who he chose as a particular possession to be a kingdom of priests, Ezekiel, I mean, uh, Exodus 19, 5 and 6, had become a negative influence to who he is and not a positive instrumentality to who he is. This tells me that Revelation runs both ways. Now, we don't often think about that, but it really, really does. God will use his people as an affirmation of who he is. Now, it may be in a sense of judgment. Hopefully, it's going to be in a sense of affirmation. But God's going to use this nation who has so backslid, who is so idolatrous, who has so uh, amalgamated, if you please, the, his worship with all the fertility gods of Canaan, with all the astral deities of Mesopotamia, and uh, his 
his worship had become so watered down, so polluted, there was no hope but a radical surgery to get the thing right. But here are the people in captivity, lost all their possessions, lost many of their family, lost all of the objects of religious hope they had, and God speaks to them. And this is what he says. I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to gather you again. You will rebuild. You will repopulate. You will be back in the promised land. And I'm not going to do it, Israel, because of who you are. I'm going to do it, Israel, because of who I am. You know, the chapter that follows 36 is the famous chapter of the dry bone. You know the song, the hip bone connected to the thigh bone? That came from Ezekiel 37. You didn't know that, did you? See, you learn something every, every time you come to church, learn something new. God has promised to revitalize that valley of dry bones, and this is the, this is the literary promise before that poetic example of them coming back to life is presented. Now, when I, when I begin to read this, it is not for your name's sake, it is for my holy name. I begin to think, you know, <clears throat> that really catches the essence of the unconditional promises and the conditional promises. You know, when we look at the nation of Israel today, and I know that Israel is not a religious nation. Israel is a very secular nation, but happens to be extremely nationalistic. But I want to tell you, God made some promises to a group of people. And I think because of who God is, those promises have validity through time. And it is not how godly or repentant or worthy or notorious that the nation of Israel is that God is going to work on their behalf. But I think because of who God is, God is going to do something for this people because his name's involved and his promises are, is involved and who he is is involved more than any worth or merit on the part of the Jewish people. Now, I want to tell you the truth. If you go back to Deuteronomy 7, 9, 11, right through there, you'll find a very startling statement. We often get confused when we think of Israel as the people of God, the chosen people. We think that that is a, a sign of special favor or special love. I would say no. It's, a, it's, it's like God choosing Abraham. God chose Abraham not because he was so righteous or holy or better than, the, than his peers. God chose Abraham because he st wanted to start somewhere to reveal who God is. It had nothing to do with Abraham's goodness. It had everything to do with who God is. Same with Israel. God wanted a people to reach the world, and God picked. God picked, listen to me, the smallest, the most stubborn, the most stiff-necked, the most rebellious, the most idolatrous people he could find. Now, does that make any sense to you? Why would God pick the, 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 the hardest? so God's grace would show as an even brighter light. If Israel was such a wonderful, faithful, loving people, the rest of the world would say God just loves them because of how they act. My soul, when Israel plays the fool for hundreds of years, and over and over and over and over and over and over again they play the fool, and over and over again they go after idols, and over and over again God has to judge them, you begin to realize that God chose them simply because of that to show who he is through them. And the same is very true for us. I like in Romans chapter 8, 5, verse 8, where it says, While ye were yet sinners, Christ died for. Died for the ungodly. Why is that? Because God did not want you to say, Well, God really wanted me to be a part of his team. I'm really a wonderful person. Boy, God got a bargain when he got me. No, God got junk when he got you. And anything you are, he made you. You see, our merit is not going to stand up before God because the only standard before God is God himself. The Old Testament put it to this way. Be ye holy 
for I, your God, am holy. The New Testament puts it, be ye perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect. None of us meet that standard. Israel certainly didn't. But in the context of Israel's miserable failure, God says, but I'm still God, and I still made some promises, and my name's still involved in who you are, and I'm going to act. Now, I think it's important that when it says, you have profaned among the nations where you went, and it explains that in the part that Vernon read, I have been... I have been very, very rough on you for most of the summer in the letters to the seven churches. Man, I have been romping and stomping up and down on your ought to, your should be. <laughs> and um, my toes got athlete's foot from that too, you know. But now I want to put it in perspective. What you should be and ought to be does not affect who God is. You see... God wanted to reach all the world through Israel. And what happened? The world said, look, this is the people of God. And Marduk, the Babylonian god, has taken all them captive, and they've been taken out of the land. Now, isn't, isn't God embarrassed by that kind of thing? Yeah, he is. Same way he's embarrassed when you live a godless, self-centered life among your peers and friends in our world. The same way it's horrendous the way God's children act. Horrendous! That does not affect the promises of grace. That does not make you not a child. That does not jeopardize your salvation. That's what he's saying to Israel. Israel, you're the pit. But I'm God, and I'll do what I said I'll do. Now, I think what it mentions then in verse... 23, but the nations will know that I'm the Lord. He's talking about the, about the return from the exile. But remember in history, Cyrus let all the people go. You see, I, what, what I think God communicated by bringing Israel back in the land after taking them out is the, the two-edged sword of God dealing with man. I want to tell you, God always says yes first. Grace is always the first response, the initiating response of God to man. Always God always comes in grace first. But grace spurned becomes God's wrath. I think the world has learned in the nation of Israel that God is a God of tremendous love. But God is a God of responsibilities. Now, it mentions here in verse 25, I will sprinkle you with, with water and you will be clean and I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols and this is, of course, an allusion, I think, to Numbers 19, of uh, where um, one of the Levitical kind of sacrifices involved sprinkling blood on the people, whether it was leprosy or whether it was the, the ashes of the red heifer, uh, whatever. It's a biblical allusion to sprinkling somebody ceremonially clean. Now, we've had no, we've had no uh, uh inkling or inclination or anything in this text about repentance. Did you notice that? There is nothing so far that says, if you'll turn to me, I will. We're not in a conditional passage. We're in an unconditional passage. God's not saying, if you'll get your act together, I'll bring you back in the land. God knew they couldn't get their act together. Lord knows he asked them over and over and they couldn't. It's a perfect Old Testament foundation for the purpose of the law is to show man that man can't, so God can. As long as man thinks he can, God can't. So, and now the people know they can't get their act together. And then God comes in grace again and promise and says, I'll make you clean. I'll do something you can't do for yourself. I'll come again to you in grace. This is the people of God now. Okay? God says, I'll come again and do what you can't do for yourself. And here's the promise. We call it the, the New Covenant in the Old Testament. If I was in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, another famous passage of this same kind of the grace of God, the initiating grace of God. And here it is in Ezekiel. Moreover, I will give you a new heart, put a new spirit within you. By the word, word spirit there should be a small s. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes 
and you'll be careful to observe my ordinances. You will live in the land I gave your forefathers. Look at verse 29. Moreover, I will save you from all your uncleanness. I will make your grain to multiply. I will not bring famine on you. I will multiply the fruit of your trees. This is no conditional passage. God is acting because of who God is. The purpose of Israel is revelation. God is showing that in the midst of rebellion and sin and stubbornness, God will still do it. Why? Because God promised. Friends, I want to tell you, grace is the only place to begin the understanding of Christian life. Now, responsibility is very important, and we've missed that. But grace is the only place to start. I think if I had to pick some kind of a New Testament uh, equivalent to this, it would be Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. And we love to talk about 8 and 9 because we like grace. For by grace have you been saved through faith, that not of yourself, the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But ten is very important. But you were created in Christ Jesus for good works, that it was foreordained that you should walk in them. Now, where's the balance? Here is God saying, I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to put a new heart within you. I'm going to put you back in the land. I'm going to make the land fruitful. I'm going to cleanse you. I'm going to forgive you. No, no word so far about man's response. Now, isn't that the way God always comes to us? You know, I really think that we think if we're a good person and we're sincere and we attend church, that surely God will have mercy on us. No, you no, no. Don't you understand that? You can't be good enough. You can't do enough. You can't go enough. You can't pray enough. You can't read enough. We don't have any hope to be right with God through our own efforts. But in the midst of that hopelessness, and you must understand that first, comes the unbelievable spotlight of the grace of God that says, I'm going to do for you something because of who I am, not because of who you are. Oh, Christians, if you'd ever understand that, half of your activity would stop until you get your attitude right about it. (laughs) I want to tell you, when I finally realized the unconditional grace of God, it was the greatest burden off my back I've ever felt in my life. For all my Christian life, I felt like I had to do religious things. I had to do this, and I had to do that, and I had to do this, or somehow God wouldn't love me. And the day it dawned on me, I'm going to do it because of who I am, Bob, not because of who you are. Boy, what a tremendous day in my life. I still do everything I used to do and more. But I do it out of gratitude, not out of have to. I do it out of an overflow of the spirit within, not the, the working it up of the old man, the flesh. Oh, Israel had no claim on God. That's exactly why God came. Now, the new heart... The new mind is an Old Testament way of speaking of the entire person. When it speaks here, put my spirit within you, I don't want to get full-blown New Testament theology here because I don't think this is teaching the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in this particular text. You want to go to John 14, 15, 16, 17? Yes, full-blown, indwelling spirit. Another Old Testament way is saying this is my spirit, the spirit of God came upon me. It's used four times in the servant song of Isaiah to speak about Christ. Therefore, I think it's very important we realize that God is going to enable us to do what God wants us to do. Haven't we seen that? We don't emotionalize our way to God. We don't work our way to God. We don't sincerize our way to God. God does it in us. That's because none of us are going to stand before God and say, boy, I'm really a religious hot dog. I'm really something, aren't I? No, you're really nothing. (laughs) Sorry. When you've done all that you can do, the Bible says you still say, I'm an unworthy servant. It's God. Now, when it mentions down here, I'm going to skip to verse 31 because I recognize the time. Verse 31, though, because I think the Bible is dialectical truth. God always presents the balance in the context if we'll look at the whole context. 
But what we do is we proof text. You know, I have a theory that most Christians know about 20 Bible passages, and they live their life based on 20 Bible passages. You know, they've got one on grace, they've got one on salvation, got one on sin, they've got one on, on heaven, they've got a couple on hell, they got, you know. The Bible's a lot more than 20 passages. We've got to catch that beautiful balance that God always brings to His Word. I was talking about the unconditional, unmerited, undeserved, initiating grace of God. New Covenant. Now, I want to start in 31 for man's response. Then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good. You will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. I am not doing this for your sake, declares the Lord God. Let it be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your ways, O house of Israel. Now, friends, that's blowing and going repentance. That is remembering from the height which we've fallen. That is exactly the affirmation of those last seven churches. Folks, don't you realize that man's relationship with God always starts from God, always comes from His grace. He always takes the initiative. He always comes first. He always fulfills His promises because of who He is. But that's not all of the Bible. God has so structured His world that God works in the lives and hearts of men, churches, and nations when God takes the initiative, man responds. They will remember. They will repent. They will turn. They will not walk the same road they walked before. They will do the will of God because of God's Spirit in them. But that takes cooperation. You say, well, which is it? Yes. Yes, it's God's grace, it's man's appropriate response. You say, well, well, you're just, what are you, Calvinistic or Arminian? Yes, yes. God always comes in grace. You can't deserve it, my friend. Why don't you quit trying to? You know, some of the, some of the wildest chickens with their necks ring are Christians trying to do God's work. <laughs> We get so busy doing God's work, we forgot why we're doing it. No. Totally without merit, totally without anything on your part, God comes and says, I love you. I love you very much. I love you enough to die for you. I want you to be my child. I love you. No strings attached. I love you. But once we accept the grace of God, the love of God, suddenly there is a lifestyle mandate of gratitude and overflow, an appropriate response and inappropriate response. I guess the dichotomy I usually express to you this way, which I think is very good, and I want you to listen to what I'm saying. Salvation is absolutely free. No strings attached. Man can't deserve it. Man can't merit it. Man can't work for it. Man can't think his way into it. Man can't uh, be sincere enough or enthusiastic enough or baptized enough. It is free. It is totally apart from you. It is in the heart of God. But salvation costs everything that you have and you are and you can be and you will be. It is the pearl of great price. That once we find it, we sell everything and buy the pearl. It is commitment so radical. It's free. No man can take it from God. It is given without strings. But once it is given, we begin to self-limit ourselves. Once it is given, the overflow of gratitude makes us respond bond in a 24-hour day, seven-day-a-week lifestyle commitment to God. It is a relationship that issues in a lifestyle. You say, well, which is most important? Yes. Yes. 
Lord Jesus, I thank you for the undeserved, totally free, initiating gift that you've brought to us. Lord, I, I don't have words to say thank you. I don't even understand why you would love us that much. But God, I want to tell you that I want to say thank you any way that I can. It seems like your book tells me that I can say thank you. Even though I can't deserve it or merit it or be worthy of it, I can say thank you by the way that I live and the priorities of my life. Oh God, as Israel was such a miserable, miserable means of revealing your name to her neighbors, forgive us when we so blow it in our world. Forgive us when we turn people away from you and Forgive us, Lord, when our lifestyle does not reflect the radical call of discipleship. But, oh God, thank you that my salvation doesn't depend on who I am. Lord, I'm thankful that you gave it to me, that you keep it for me. For, Lord, I know I would blow it. Lord, but because it's free and because it's eternal and because it's secure oh convict my heart for the way I live help me to live in such a way that men and women might turn to you in faith Lord help my mind to rest in grace but help my feet to work in love in Jesus name Amen I want to set the stage one more time before offer invitation. There are two kinds of Christian in Trinity Baptist Church. There's two kinds of Christians in the world. There are Christians who have sat down by the pole of justification and say, I'm saved, it's free, I'll do what I want to, or I'll do nothing at all. There are the Christians who are so overwhelmed by the, by the overwhelming grace of God and the responsibilities involved that they break themselves to pieces trying to, to run to the pole of sanctification. Some, some Christians have tried so hard they've given up because they never could make it. We must live between those poles. We must accept God's acceptance but never, never be satisfied with who and what and where we are. We must allow God's forgiveness just the way we are we must constantly be striving to be more than we are in Him. We must be willing to accept ourselves, but to loathe ourselves. We must be willing to accept what God has done for us. We must be willing to always run the race for Him. Both are required. It is a movement back and forth between failure and forgiveness, but trying again and again and again and again the Christian life is not a plane to be reached. It's a battle to be fought. It's not, a, it's not a flag to be won. It is a race to be run. The victory is in running the race, not crossing the line. The victory is getting ready for battle and moving out, not winning the war. I think that'll help. I hope that'll help. <laughs>